Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's TF Together session with director and co-founder of Black History Month Florence, Justin Randolph Thompson. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much, Justin, for joining us. Uh, we're delighted to hear about the many initiatives you have going on right now. And I'm sure that they're made all the more timely and essential given recent events and the worrying scenes that are pervading our screens. Um, but before we look at that topic, perhaps we could go back to the beginning with why and how Black History Month Florence came about. Yeah, well, th thanks so much for the invitation to be here and to sort of speak to the work that we're doing um, and the work that's sort of needed um, ongoing in this context of Florence. Um, Black History Month Florence really uh, was initiated in 2016, um, but it was a bit of a, a culmination of different reflections and responses to the, the setting of Florence and different things that were happening here that I was involved in. So I was, in, I was a part of um, a really important um, conference and exhibition um, that was organized by um, New York University, um, that was called Resignifications, the exhibition, and the conference itself was called Black Portraitures, which is a, a combined um, conference put together by New York University's uh, Tisch School and uh, Harvard. Um, and that brought such uh, an amazing energy and such a beautiful range of conversations to the city of Florence that I really wanted to engage in. And um, as an artist, I was both a part of the exhibition and I was part of the, the conference itself speaking to my work and some of my research. And I think that that moment of seeing all these people in a space that for me was home um, right. felt so wonderful. But then at the same time, there was also this reflection on the fact that amongst this amazing audience, um, there were very few of the people that I'd live with on day to day. And so what it meant for this conversation to happen in Florence and not be, you know, reaching the people that I would ultimately be, you know, engaging with uh, right. afterwards um, was a bit of a, one of the first reflections that we have. Um, and, you know, my conversations that were ongoing with the curator Alam Ankpa around that, with the then director of NYU, Ellen Toscano, were really, really amazing. And the work that NYU was doing at that time was really sort of planting the seeds um, for a lot of reflections on Blackness in the context of Italy, including the creation of a uh, course um, called Black Italia. And I think that. Um, you know, I got together with a friend of mine who has also been in Florence actually longer than I have, um, Andre Halyard, um, who is a musician um, and, and a friend. And um, we started to talk about what it would mean to sort of have this kind of conversation happen in Italy and happen right. in Florence and thinking about how we would have to reshape the context for uh, Black History Month as a sort of thought, um, relocate to this space where it would not be focused on African-American history or African-Americans and would have to sort of broaden its its spectrum. Um, so we sort of together in that moment um, decided to just press go without very much preparation. Um, we engaged um, uh, sort of communications um, uh, expert, um, Andrea Mi, um, who has uh, since passed, unfortunately, um, who gave us a hand with really getting that first edition on its feet and getting the publication about it out into the world. Um, and from there, it sort of, you know, picked up. Um, we, we very quickly uh, worked, began working with Janine Gael, who is uh, still the co-director, who works alongside me. And, um, you know, from there, the rest is sort of history. Um, but we started with just 20 events. Uh, okay. So a really small um, undertaking. Well, it's, it's wonderful to see the community being formed here in Florence. Um, um, in awe at the extensive work you do each year, the festival just seems to be growing. Um, perhaps you could tell us about some of your current projects then. Uh, maybe we could start with Fisky Perfiaski, which is a fantastic name, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so to begin with that, I mean, that's actually um, not not even out there in the world as of yet. Um, we should be sort of launching uh, some of the publicity around this as of as of tomorrow. Oh wow! <laughs> but uh, um, it's it's a project. Fiski per fiaski. We sort of took this uh, this phrase, um, which is often uh, used in in the Italian context, which is which is which is about confusion. It's about confusing one thing for another. Um, that's, that's our saying in English. And um, I think that a lot of times when we think about the 
sense of cultural confusion that surrounds us on the daily, um, most of the time, what is at the heart of that is a lack of positionality, a lack of people being able to see themselves and reflecting upon their own position in relation to the subject matter that they're looking at. And so um, one of the things that we thought would be sort of an interesting and helpful thing was to create a series of conversations that would really di dive into that and really push people through um, a series of sort of open workshops and really informal exchanges to sort of share their own reflections and their own beings and their own background and their own experience uh, with each other and with these um, facilitators. Um, this is a project that was brought forth in the framework of um, what um, Villa Romana is calling Scuola Popolare. Um, it hasn't started yet. It'll start um, next week. And um, there's, there's going to be a whole long listing of different events that are happening in Villa Romana in the gardens that sort of think about the Scuola Popolare and different approaches in which we can think about um, the audience that, that hangs out around contemporary art, which is tiny, and really think about how do we expand that. And I think that one of the ways in which we can expand that is to sort of not um, approach things through some of those default strategies to audience and to seek a broader audience through expanding the programming and the kind of reflections that happen. Um, these are the things that sort of make uh, any initiative more interesting um, and attract more people is by actually really creating things that people are after. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's an important sort of a social experience and ex experiment as well. Uh, we decided to do it with a, a group of um, really amazing people who are very fortunately around Black History Month, Florence, and around me uh, quite often. Um, so we have a list of five different events that will happen over the next five weeks, um, starting June 22nd and ending July 20th. We have um, uh, we have Angelica Pizzerini, who is a sociologist. She teaches Black Italia, which I mentioned before at NYU, Florence. Um, we have um, Dudu Quate, who is a griot and musician, a uh, really amazing being up in Bergamo. Um, we have um, Adam Asane, who's coming down from Milan, who is the um, CEO of Moleskine Foundation um, and just an incredible thinker and creative individual. Um, and then um, we also have Antonella Bundu, who is um, based right here in Florence and who I think most people in Florence will already know as an uh, um, activist and politician working in the Consiglio Comunale. Um, and then uh, lastly, to sort of close it, we have Patrick Tacheda, who is um, an artist and activist based in Bologna, who is actually the current director of Black History Month Bologna, which is the first sort of outgrowth of Black History Month Florence's efforts and uh, a partner institution that we've been developing together. Wow. And it sounds like a very exciting lineup of events there. Um, I suppose we could maybe move on then to another initiative that you have, which is the Black Archive Alliance. Um, how can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, Black Archive Alliance is something that um, w was initiated with a very simple premise. Um, mm -hmm. As we started to think about ways to sort of expand outside of the month framework, that was really constraining the work that we were doing as Black History Month Florence, where a lot of people thought that we just literally stopped after February and picked back up right, right. before February. And, you know, obviously, in essence, we are always working and thinking. And, um, you know, some of the questions that would come to me very often were uh, about why, like why Black History Month in the context of, of Italy, why Florence, like what, what is it, what, what kind of histories are there? Is there a history? And the kind of absence of uh, real dialogue around these things in, in a very general public, obviously in specialized publics, there's a lot of knowledge around hence our uh, community. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it was really important to sort of think about what was in Florence. And so we, we started work together with uh, Villa Romana again. Um, and uh, Villa Romana actually headed that project where we decided to go in and essentially map a series of archives, uh, personal and private, but also public collections okay. in Florence and around Florence that had connections between Italy and Africa. And these varied, we put together 20 different institutions we were working with, and these varied from uh, a personal collection um, of um, you know, the uh, Antonello Bundu's brother, Leonard Bundu, and his, his paraphernalia from his numerous trophies, which really did make Italian history in the boxing world. Um, and then, you know, all the way up to like looking at the Biblioteca Laurenziana and thinking about all of the holdings that they have going back to the 1400s. Um, and, you know, really it was, a, it was a moment where we could also think about all these different moments of history, which 
honestly, walking into it, we really thought that we, you would have to do a ton of research and really have to search to find these things. But once we walked in the door of every single one of these spaces, we found that this stuff was right there. It was oh. just simply not being examined, not being brought to the light. And so this was also, uh, you know, we went into the, um, what used to be called the Instituto Agronomico Altremare, which okay. was um, a colonial institution really looking at and surveying the value of land abroad. So when we're thinking about the Italian colonies in East Africa, this is where a lot of the map, the um, sort of photographs and considerations were put out. Um, and you know, all the way down to also like the Fundazione Giorgio Lapira and really thinking about the role that Giorgio Lapira, the then mayor of Florence in the 60s had in creating the Dialoghi Mediterranean, so the Mediterranean Dialogues, inviting a number of leaders from, uh, from various countries in Africa to Florence to talk about the state of a recently liberated um, uh, continent where um, so many of these colonial strongholds were falling apart and uh, were, you know, revolutionary, um, acts were taking place to overthrow them. And, right. you know, um, some one of my favorite sort of findings in that realm th was um, the speech by um, Leopold Senghor, um, because there was an ongoing relationship between Leopold Senghor, who was the then uh, president of Senegal, um, and George Lapierre, the mayor of Florence at the time. And there was an ongoing exchange and dialogue of letters, um, which had been written about in a really wonderful book um, I, uh, by a woman named Gloria Rosati. Um, and um, that contains a number of speeches which he gave in the 1960s on the steps of Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, that when we listen to the ways in which the conversation is happening, what's being addressed, obviously they're still relevant. I mean, uh, we sort of, um, I, I think that a lot of times around, around blackness in the world, um, we have this sense, wow, it's amazing how it's still relevant in the 60s. And I think that you know we shouldn't really be so surprised by that fact, given really uh, the sort of social structures that surround us and the kinds of values that they've instilled. Right. It's um, just to add one little fragment to that. Also, I think that the the Black Archive Alliance we moved into Volume Two last year. Um, mm -hmm. So besides sort of mapping the. Um, different spaces and putting up a series of exhibitions in those spaces to invite people into the archives themselves. Also about sort of breaking down some of the uh, safeguarding of ar archives as these sort of uh, places where only scholars can go. Um, mm -hmm. In the second edition, we actually created a, a group of uh, mentors that are various people situated in institutions across Florence. And we had them mentor a group of students um, to go and do the research directly um, in these spaces. Um, each one is accompanied by a catalog. This time we presented the results of it um, in uh, Le Murate, um, uh, in the space Murate Art District in their Emorateca, which they've been ongoing um, collaborators over the years. So it was sort of a natural space for that conversation to happen. And it, it's ongoing research. So I mean, every time there's a new volume of Black Archive Alliance, there's a new format to how we can think about these things. Because ultimately what we're interested in is how do we provoke and push for more research to happen, more profound conversations to happen? How can we even allow students to sort of pick up where the first student left off mm -hmm. and think about what hasn't been explored in that individual archive or space or site? And um, I think also what, what do the current situations in which we find ourselves tell us about those historical moments and the amnesia that surrounds them so often? Fascinating. I mean, to have discovered those links and have been sitting there for waiting discovery is remarkable that I mean I'm, I'm glad that your work is doing it seems so valuable and incredible that it I suppose it took until now for this to have been um brought to life in some sense. Um, I mean Black History Month Florence uh, we were discussing that it's Black History Month Florence unique in Italy um in terms of the format of the mm -hmm. events and the structure of it. So it's wonderful to see that it's starting to become so widespread. I mean, there's also the back on Bologna now as a this am I right? It's the first edition this year. Yeah, um, it was it, the Black History Month Bologna um, was sort of born as an, an outgrowth of um, the the work that that we've been doing. Um, I've been having an ongo ongoing conversation with the artist Patrick Tachero, who's based in Bologna, who's originally from Cameroon, and um, you know, just talking about some of the ways in which we feel pushed as artists to sort of contribute to something beyond the work that we can put on the walls. Right. And um, you know how to do that, um, and I think that right. after long-standing conversations with Patrick, we talked about what it would mean to sort of expand uh, Black History Month Florence as a, 
sort of space and consideration into other cities and uh, how we could help to provide a sense of the tactics that we actually use and maybe use some of the history that we've created over these five years to um, facilitate some of the entrance to some of these spaces. So I think, I think it's important also to sort of highlight the fact that, that um, while um, you know, Black History Month Florence in its structure and sort of approach is uh, unique to Italy, um, this kind of work and research has been uh, going on uh, for, for a very long time. And um, we actually still very fortunately are in dialogue with so many amazing people that have been advancing these conversations, um, some of them since the eighties. Right. And um, you know, it really, um, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's super, it's incredibly magical to just share space with, with some of these uh, figures, um, including someone like Papa Giao, who we always sort of lean towards, um, just to sit down with Papa Giao and have a real conversation um, is, is magic. Um, because right. there's, there's this accumulation of experience and knowledge in this space, living in the space of Italy and really reflecting upon these conversations here. And, you know, also seeing this sort of lack. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of what we're doing, and I mean, and there's, there's plenty of others, um, the, uh, um, Florence Gospel Choir is led by Nehemiah Brown, who has consistently been thinking about um, the Black experience and been thinking about um, Black American traditions such as gospel and how they can exist in this space. Um, and, and that's been a, a long history um, through these people, through these figures, through these oh, individuals. Yeah. And, you know, I, for me, it's really important to sort of acknowledge the work that, that they've been doing and the ways in which those things become um, something that we work really more as glue. Um, okay. Because I think that sometimes the impact that we can have as individuals is is just not enough uh, when you're working in a bit of a, a niche and something yeah. that is dismissed as a niche that is really irrelevant in this yeah. context, which is often the perception. So I think that you know when we think about the different spaces and conversations and institutions and researchers that are all across Italy, um, yes. you know, uh, there's a, there's a old, very old saying which is. It takes a village, and that's a philosophy that we really, really rely on because, you know, a single voice like my own um, is really, um, it's not only not enough, it's just not, it's not even, it's such a small fragment of any story right. um, that um, I, I think it's really uh, important that each one of us who are working in this realm think about the ways in which we can provide platforms for everyone else. Yes. And really think about the ways in which um, these platforms that we're providing can provide the baseline for a more complex conversation. And oh. each time we walk into it, we can get deeper, you know? Because I think a lot of times what 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 lacks around Afro-descendant people in regards to dialogue in the context of Italy is is getting getting profound, um, is getting beyond sort of superficial, getting beyond the stereotypes. And a lot of times when we take these shortcuts to thinking about um, you know, uh, when we think about blackness on, in, a, in a global landscape, it, it, it's really so endless what that actually means in terms of the cultures that are involved, the histories that it encompasses, um, that when you flatten that to a singular stereotype, you really, um, you, you lack humanity. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something um, Leopold Senghor in his speech in 1962 started that speech by saying, do you have peace, people of Florence? And I think that in saying that, he was also talking about the fact that, you know, without these reflections, nobody's whole. Okay. No, I guess that then my question would have been better phrased uh, uh, the first time. Would have been better phrased, uh, uni unity, I guess, in terms of as you said, being the glue and putting them together. Um, uh, that was possibly what I, what I should have started my question with. So, no, no, no. I, so, I, so I your appreciate way. your question. And, and I, I think it's very valid and very, very important. Um, I, I always, uh, and, and, and it really is, um, you know, our initiative in the in the format that it takes on, which is um, really sort of an open framework, not a curated thing, but it is a unified effort, a unified program. These things are absolutely unique um, in the context of Italy. And unfortunately, outside of, um, you know, Black History Month efforts that tend to be a single event held here and there, um, yes. across Italy, which have been around for a long time. Um, there has been efforts um, on the part of one of our uh, consiglieri, one of our advisors, um, uh, Matthias Mesquita, uh, to create um, what he's been bringing forth as the Settimana di Afrodiscendenza, the week 
dedicated to Afrodesian dance uh, for a while now. But I, but I do think that the sort of structure and vision that we have that expands beyond these sort of moments and beyond the philosophy of the festival into longstanding research, that that's very unique to this space. Um, and uh, it, it's only able to move forward relying on all of those really wonderful people that, that step up and, uh, you know, get involved. Oh, wonderful. Um, and then, of course, maybe we could lead into a bit of discussion about the On Being Present exhibition with the Uffizi. Perhaps you could tell us something about that. Sure. Sure. So um, on, on Being Present um, is a, a sort of coordinated research project and virtual exhibition that is on the Uffizi's um, uh, website under the uh, category Hypervisions. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the Uffizi has this um, virtual platform that is also um, engaging in reflecting in a more um, dynamic way than we typically look at art history and the ways in which um, museum spaces also need um, broader reflections to sort of engage with them. And they have a whole um, uh, series of interventions, including something that is wonderful, like the Fabrica delle Historie, um, which in which they invited a number of people um, uh, across different um, uh, from different backgrounds in the context of Florence to come in and tell stories around the paintings uh, without necessarily giving art historical information and thinking about the ways in which those kinds of narrations actually change the way we see those same paintings and invite everyone to have their own interpretation, um, invite everyone to contribute their own reflection on history. Um, and so um, uh, I was really happy that um, the Uffizi embraced our proposal to um, you know, coordinate uh, a research project where we reached out to nine different scholars. Um, the range of backgrounds of these scholars is uh, pretty extensive in terms of geography, institutional affiliation, and in terms of actual focus. Um, so everything from like musicology to history, like it's, it's, it's pretty broad. And um, each of these nine um, thinkers um, created a new series of texts in dialogue, each one with a, a painting present in the Uffizi galleries or in Palazzo Pitti, so in the collective collections there. And um, really um, the, the idea was to sort of think about, um, you know, basically in, in, in the contemporary history, if we really look um, in the last 20 years, there's actually been a lot of conversations that have been had around um, black African presence in, in Renaissance Europe. Um, mm -hmm. There's been exhibitions, um, including um, the Walters in Baltimore. Um, there's been editions and volumes of books, right? The image of the black in Western art, um, you know, advanced also by uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr. Um, th there's all this wonderful framing. And then of course, more um, recently, um, the black model, um, which was uh, lastly in uh, Musée d'Orsay. Um, these are all sort of conversations that are emerging that really are about um, the need to reflect on these figures and these presences, which actually tell us something about um, history and representation. Um, mm -hmm. Also in terms of like who's being represented, how they're being represented, but then also just about presence that was actually here and the ways in which um, people can be thought of and populations and cultures can be thought of through a different framework than our contemporary lens. And it's really important for us to examine those histories and think about what was being said mm -hmm. and how that in, in what the implications of that are today. Um, honestly, that's that reflection was sparked also by resignifications and the work that was done in that exhibition because it was so much about, um, it, it wasn't just artists, like there was a bunch of us artists in there, but then there was a ton of scholars who were invited in to think specifically about Blackmores. Um, so this sort of um, form, usually through the form of furniture or art, artisan-based objects um, representing Afri Black Africans. Um, and that, research and the sort of openness of that field really were super intriguing to me. And, you know, I thought that it would be super, it would be really wonderful if a singular institution like the Uffizi, which is also one of the gatekeepers of sort of the canon of Western art, right, um, would begin to have a conversation about what these presences in their um, collection actually say, what they do. And I, I thought it also would be really a pla practical way um, you know, with my team, we always talk about also what, what's practical in the approaches that we're doing. And, you know, I think that uh, one of the practicalities was about the fact that, you know, uh, tour guides who walk into the Uffizi, um, who are giving tours in the context of Florence and more broadly in Italy, when they are questioned about um, Black African figures in the paintings, it's, it's too frequent that they really don't have any knowledge 
about who those figures are, yeah. and um, or um, they, you know, in, in worst cases, maybe make it up. Um, and, and so I, I thought that this sort of hypervisions, which is so much about an approachable content in terms of language, would be a really wonderful way to, um, you know, provide also that content so that, you know, somebody who's walking through the feeds can actually be equipped with some really basic information and sometimes more profound information um, so that when they're asked that question, they can they can provide the, the, the content. Um, yeah. And I, I think that, you know, so it's been really, um, it, it was injected into their website and we're, we're developing um, a reflection on what volume two would look like because we only touched a small fragment of what their holdings are. And of course, you know, like everything that we do in the lens of BHMF, um, we want everything to be um, an ongoing process. We, everything's a work in progress. Everything needs development that goes further. Everything needs to be reassessed over and over again. And so um, that, that project has been particularly um, exciting in that sense. And I think the title, which we drew um, from uh, a writer, um, who um, was writing about, um, you know, actually um, uh, what it means to sort of decolonize museums. Mm -hmm. um, and we were thinking a little bit about the, the idea of presence and sometimes, you know, how presence is really just the most basic thing we can ask to acknowledge. Um, so, you know, going from that really basic acknowledgement, how can we arrive at something that actually really informs us and brings us into a contemporary reflection on these subjects? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, perhaps we could uh, discuss the YGPI research residency. Um, would you like to give a quick explanation? Then I can share um, a one minute video that gives some visual to the project. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, you know, um, the, in the ongoing work of uh, Black History Month Florence over the years, one of the things that we've done is we've highlighted a number of um, Afro-descendant artists who are based in Italy. Um, it's been sort of a natural um, focus. Um, and so amongst the, you know, 10 exhibitions a year that we put on, there's always uh, been consistently um, um, Afro-descendant um, artists who are based right here in Italy to think about these presences and the ways in which, um, you know, um, a, a lot of times there's sort of a lack of knowledge of these presences and of these artists working in this context that is so isolated seemingly from the international eye. Um, and so through that work, um, of course, we, it, it becomes natural to think about sort of uh, younger generations. Mm -hmm. And there's a really intriguing fact, which is in the context of Italy, um, you know, one of the things that is being negotiated, developed and reflected upon more constantly in the last 20 years is um, the idea of second generation and of Black Italians, Afro-Italiani. There's a million different ways in which um, these, these, these words are constructed and used, and I'm not going to get into all the breakdowns uh, between them, but I, I do think that um, it was important to really think about um, um, what it means for um, a younger generation of artists working here to develop their own language um, around identity, to develop their own language around what it means to um, uh, be born and raised or to exist in this Italian space, given colonial histories, um, given the contemporary history of racism, given all these frameworks, um, existing as this sort of marginal identity in the context of um, the Italian art world, right, which is uh, this other completely uh, elitist realm that I, I participate in. Um, um, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do was to sort of create a platform for the gathering of um, the, these youngsters, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I think that, you know, honestly, this idea was born, you know, most of the things that uh, Black History Month Florence brings forward have models and have precedents in other spaces. And it's really thinking about, okay, what does it mean to take that model and that reflection and apply it here. And okay. so, you know, this um, YGBI is sort of a super micro uh, reflection on something that is enormous that was created by Theaster Gates in Chicago, which is called Black Artist Retreat. And I had the real privilege of attending uh, two Black Artist Retreats and to see what it means to sort of share space um, uh, with um, literally hundreds uh, of black artists. Um, so the sort of prerequisite is that, you know, only uh, black artists are allowed in this space. And so it's also the space of non-performativity. 
um, where there is no audience and it's really just us sharing with each other. And um, I thought it really, it was so impactful to me to be in that space and have those kinds of conversations, which were not intended for the public. Um, the kind of networking that happens, the kind of solidarity and just the sort of acknowledgement that happens in those spaces that we thought it important to sort of create something like that in the context of, of Italy as well. So we created this uh, project called YGBI, which stands for Young, Gifted, Black. And the last letter, it can be Italy, Italian, it's up for grabs. Okay. Italiani, um, uh, we can go where we want. Um, okay. But um, you know, it, it was created to invite sort of a group of young artists. And so we invited five um, Afro-descendant artists, all based in Italy, um, some of which were born here, others which came for study. Um, into a space where they would have a conversation with each other, would share experiences and reflections, and then also would connect to a broader reflection on uh, diaspora. And yeah. in order to engage in this conversation, in order to make it practically feasible for us, um, we uh, collaborated with um, OCAD, Ontario College of Art and Design, who provided the studio spaces and actually who brought over two curators who really um, were the mentors and they guided the conversation that we had here um, and that's Andrea Fatona and Leif Jalifia. Um, they came in and really, um, I mean, literally, we sort of prepared the space, um, held that space, and they filled it um, with the artists. And, um, you know, that kind of dialogue and exchange was so rich and incredible, thanks to that mentorship. And we collaborated with uh, the Student Hotel, uh, additionally, to have um, a space in Florence, because I think the Student Hotel has this unique um, framework where we're simultaneously looking at um, uh, a space literally for housing people, mm -hmm. um, hotel, long-term lodging for students, uh, shared spaces, co-working, and then also sort of a cultural hub. And you know they have classrooms there. So um, we collaborated with them on a number of different levels of the project where they hosted the artists and um, they also, um, we're, we're able to provide us with spaces for gathering um, so that we could have a sort of closed behind doors conversation. Um, and that was like hugely important to the success of this project. And really it was a 10 day research residency. So it was not, it was um, not designed uh, to be about the production of art. It was designed to be about the research and the behind the scenes that is so necessary in art making. And through it, we brought and connected these artists to local realities like Papi Diao, who came in as a speaker, Angelica Pizzerini, who came in as a speaker, um, and uh, Maria Stella Rognoni, who came in as a speaker, really thinking about figures that are present in the Florentine landscape that really can contribute to these conversations in a way that only they can. Yeah. And um, uh, giving, allowing them to be sort of the, the ambassadors to the context of Florence for these artists. And, um, you know, also to really generate the sense of um, uh, really, uh, I think, um, solidarity and collectivity, which is really what we were aiming for. So these 10 days produce that. And then after that, uh, we're still in the process of producing um, the exhibitions and research projects that are gonna be born from that experience. Um, in the collaborative and developmental phase, I worked uh, closely with Simone Frangi, who's a curator um, based in Milan, who's a really uh, super amazing thinker and has been consistently a part of uh, the dialogue that we're having. Um, you know, Michelle Davis, of course, at the, the Student Hotel was important in sort of making sure that these things actually worked and flowed. We collaborated with um, the, the Kennedy Center for Human Rights for additional lodging through our um, co-promotion, which the city of Florence has co-promoted Black History Month Florence for the past uh, three years and provided this kind of space and service, which really makes it feasible for us to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the first year, but we're actually working on volume two where we'll invite in another five um, artists, Afro-descendant artists based in Florence and what we're, I mean, sorry, based in Italy. And mm -hmm. we're hoping to sort of create through that um, a, a broader, um, uh, dialogue and conversation, but at the same time also um, to make sure that people know about each other people, so that they can reach out to people so that they don't feel alone in the development of their work. And these things are more crucial than it may seem. And, you know, uh, the, the, this besides dealing with um, sort of a certain marginalization, um, you know, uh, artists deal with all sorts of other things um, as they're sort of um, working towards getting exposure and um, you know, are being exploited a lot of times for their work, wh whether it's through tokenism or through the fact that the cultural value that's been attributed to contemporary art tends to be so incredibly low. 
in this moment. And um, in the context of Italy, where it's all about art, but in terms of contemporary art, the value that's given to it is, is absolutely minimal. And so artists, art workers are, are uh, often not paid. Um, um, when they are paid, it's usually uh, not paid very well. Um, mm -hmm. And we really have to, you know, a lot of times we're made to feel like we're privileged for having the opportunity to show in spaces rather than us giving something to the institutions themselves by our presence. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are some of the narratives that need to change. And there's a lot of work that's happening in Italy that I think are doing that. Um, I joined a collective that has uh, been ongoing now since um, the uh, launching their manifesto the 1st of May, which is uh, Aoi Art Workers Italia, who are doing some really incredible work and research around what it means to sort of um, help uh, to in change the understanding of value around art workers, and also to facilitate the sort of contractual labor and to really uh, appreciate the fact that we are all working and our labor is valuable. Um, and I think that those are conversations that unfortunately in the context of Italy are very, very behind. And with that, I will uh, give a little video that will show some of the work in progress. I'll just put that on the screen now. In the, in the places of privilege. We decided to put together a through a partnership with OCAD and with just a hotel, um, a, a form of residence program to begin to have discussions about the diaspora, to begin to have comparisons uh, between the context of blackness in Canada and the context of blackness in the Italian landscape, and to really try to arrive at also different forms of language and translations. Thank you for sharing that video with us, Justin. It's wonderful to see the conversations and the dialogue taking place, and it's exciting to see that what we want to bring um, forward. Um, so, can I ask you? Um, about how you were the opening speaker at the protest held in solidarity with Black Lives Matter on June 6th in front of the American consulate. Uh, can you describe that experience and what that meant for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, um, I was invited by um, uh, the uh, organizers who was the Women's March in Florence and um, Invisible Tuscany um, to provide some opening remarks to thinking about um, the protests in the context of the United States around uh, the murder of George Floyd um, and, and you know, a whole list of others. I mean, Rana Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, now we have also Rayshard Brooks. And I mean, th these are just the sort of latest and ones that we're most aware of. Um, and I think that there was, um, uh, an interest um, in, in inviting me to sort of connect the dots also to the context of Italy. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that one of the things that what we've been seeing is that uh, this moment of um, ongoing protest um, has also uh, brought forth and brought to light um, so many of the spaces where um, issues around uh, racism, exclusion and oppression are, are incredibly present. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I was invited really to sort of make sure that, um, you know, when we go out to protest and really think about um, our solidarity with um, uh, all those who are victims of police brutality and structural and systematic oppression in the United States um, and have, have seen violence, um, th that we don't forget get the ways in which um, there's implications also in the context of Florence. So we can't go out there and march in solidarity with um, um, black people in the United States, um, forgetting about the incredibly long list of racialized murders that have happened in Florence, including Jerry Maslow, um, Abba Abdul Jubre, Sam Modu and Diop Moore here in Florence, Edith Yen here in Florence, 
you know, Sumela, Sacco. I mean, there, there's so many different names that we could list in this context of Italy um, that, that are not necessarily police murders, right? But the mm -hmm. kind of implication that's happening around sort of um, racism, um, it, it carries a lot of connections, of course. Um, the, the police are a response um, uh, to certain values that are instilled by society and things that we've um, allowed to um, guarantee a sense of safety, and obviously that safety only applies to some. And so, you know, what, we can't really divorce the oppression of the police system from all the other cultural arenas where the value of black lives has consistently been deemed um, less by, by the mainstream. And, um, you know, I, I would like to say that this is a moment where we have, um, an, an awakening around these things. But unfortunately, I, I'm not exactly sure that awakening would be the proper term because I, I, I think that I, in, in all honesty, um, I feel fairly sure that everybody was aware that right. um, you know, in the United States and here, racism is all around us. Um, it's, so it's really just about what we're willing to sort of tolerate, uh, what we feel affects us. And you know, uh, you know, it really, unfortunately, it really shouldn't take a uh, you know uh, a violent death for us to be able to have a conversation about these, I mean, ongoing um, you know injustices that, that have 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 been around for so incredibly long and really don't um, don't really seem to be looking like they're going to go away. Um, and I think you know when we think about that in the context of of Florence. So when I was invited to talk, I think it's also about the ways in which, you know, when we think about um, racist murders, where we also have to think about the lack of acknowledgement of, of black Italians period as existing, right? There's like this sort of lack of dialogue around the fact that there are a bunch of uh, black people that are Italian and the ways in which there are, um, there are their rights to citizenship have been barred, right? So we have this whole conversation around Yosoli, which needs to be engaged um, right now, but also historically, We've had conversations around Bracianti, so agricultural workers and their rights, um, you know, access to um, uh, permits um, for asylum seekers. There's such a strong and incredible um, list of things that are happening right now in the context of Italy and that have been ongoing. And uh, unfortunately, they've been uh, overall um, ignored um, so that we have, like, right, I, literally, like, you know, I think today, um, Abu Bakr. Uh, Sumaro, who has started a hunger strike um, at Villa Pamphili in Rome um, on behalf of the Braccianti. And, you know, his hunger strike brought, to, when, he, when I heard these words, it brought to mind Papa Diao in 1990, you know, doing a hunger strike against the sort of legislation that was happening around street vendors and the racism of that. And, you know, um, what's being asked through this current hunger strike is about, you know, it brings up all sorts of other things, which is, um, you know, it's asking for Italy to end or change the kind of agreements that they have with the government of Libya. Um, and this goes back to Italian colonialism in Libya, which is such an, a longstanding history that unfortunately, um, you know, a colonial history in the context of Italy has really not been confronted. Um, and I'm, I don't, again, want to dismiss the work of so many incredible people who've been working around it. But if we think about general knowledge and reflection and the ways in which that enters into classrooms and the ways in which that enters into broad general discourse, it's really um, disheartening yes. to engage in these conversations. And I think that anybody who's working in this field of post-colonial studies in the context of Italy will agree that it's disheartening to sort of dive into conversations where we remain so behind. But I think, you know, um, it, it's really, uh, it's been also um, uh, positive to see how much more broad, broadly spread and broadly felt um, this moment of protest is and the ways in which each person in their own context has not forgotten how to introduce their, their own context to the conversation and to use it as a moment of pressure. We need any moment we can to sort of advance pressure, right? Um, but it brings me to think like about also, you know, the sort of broader participation that's happening right now, uh, which includes also a, a lot of white Americans, a lot of white Italians, and, you know, people that may not have necessarily been tied to these conversations historically. Um, but it makes me think of uh, uh, an, an interview that was from the 80s with this incredible opera singer, Leontine Price. Um, she's uh, if you don't know Leontine Price, you should listen because uh, she's uh, amazing. Um, but um, 
there was an interview that happened where um, a white interviewer asked her if um, hearing Marianne Anderson gave her the understanding that she could be a singer despite, um, quote unquote, the race question. And, um, you know, her response to that, it was so um, important because she, she kind of, you know, first off, it's very, she, she's incredibly elegant in speaking about anything, but she said, you know, I don't think that the race question has ever been really a black problem. You know, it's always been other people's problem, you know, that we sort of suffer the consequences for. And so I think that when we think about the need of, of other people sort of stepping up and recognizing that this is a problem, um, you know, yeah. in, in their communities, right? Um, it, it affects our community, but it's, it's actually coming from somewhere else. And so um, the historic sort of reliance on the black community to be the ones that speak out and, you know, um, address these things um, um, is in, on one hand understandable, but of course it's also um, on the other hand, um, it, it, it only works if it's coupled with the willingness to sort of dive in and get, get your hands dirty, um, right. you know? Um, there, the exhibition that we have up, uh, Black History Month in, inaugurated an exhibition at um, Murate Art District in February, the title of that show was Sporcar Silemani per fare un lavoro pulito. Okay. Um, getting your hands dirty to do clean work. Right. And this has literally been the work of so many people in, in Afro-descending communities where we really have to get our hands dirty because nobody's really willing to do that dirty work. Um, but at the same time, we have to be so aware uh, or we have to be policed by the politics of respectability in a way that, you know, um, really makes makes it so that we have to appear to have clean hands despite all the dirty work we're doing. And, um, you know, I think it's really important um, this moment to sort of really think about long long standing efforts that have been done, recognizing those, but also think about ways in which when we um, decide to acknowledge and open the door to these kinds of conversations, which are so needed, yeah. that we can't simply open that door and then shut it behind us. Mm -hmm. But once that door is open, it's super important that we sort of evaluate um, our, ourselves our, as individuals, ourselves as community members, the people around us, our responsibility towards each other, and then also institutionally. So we have to look behind the scenes and say, okay, who have I been working with here? How are we contributing to the conversation? Right? How can we sort of make sure that this is an ongoing conversation and not just something that is symbolic? Um, yeah. I think symbols and icons are super important, but um, you know, at the end of the day, if we don't get past the symbolic and we start dealing with the real, which means every day and the daily, um, nothing really changes, you know? Um, and we end up with wonderful photos of these incredibly important moments historically, but that weren't followed by real change. And um, I think that, that that's something that real change takes effort that extends beyond the immediate and beyond the short term. And I know that like, you know, this, this moment of lockdown and the coronavirus has been one where, you know, a lot of us have um, sort of uh, started to take away future planning because the future seems so precarious. But um, it's actually a moment where we maybe need to shift our understanding of future futurity and really think about how maybe we just don't need to be planning the next month and the next two months. Maybe we can start thinking about what it means to really make long-standing five-year plans all dedicated to these reflections because these problems are not going away. And um, they, the, the, as I said, like, you know, the relevance of them will resurface here and again. Um, and, you know, it would be really wonderful to arrive at a point where um, these kinds of conversations become irrelevant because we've sort of gone past, but we're nowhere near that. Um, Leontine Price said this funny thing in the interview where she said that she understood that we were making progress uh, around the conversation around race relations in the United States when she started to get bored. <laughs> because she said, you know, I used to get really hot and bothered when people talked to me about these things. And now I'm just bored because it's so simplistic as a conversation. Like, you know, uh, now I'm bored. Um, and I, I think, you know, while I don't necessarily share that sentiment, I thought it was really telling um, to is, think about, like, you know, uh, using the parameters of progress to talk about the advancement of boredom. Right, right. <laughs> no, it's, it's infectious to hear your drive for this. Um, and it's wonderful to hear um, so much of the initiatives that, you know, you're working to try and initiatives. Um, and Perhaps I could finish then by just uh, thank you again, Justin, for sharing uh, this urgent and interesting information and also to reveal to our audience that um, 
BHMF will be curating a column going forward with the Florentine, uh, the first of which will be in our next edition, which will be on June 2nd. So we're very much looking forward to hearing and reading um, what will be very important material. So thank you for that collaboration as well and for continuing this conversation and dialogue, um, which is so essential right now. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you again, Justin. And yeah, I mean, I think that you know the okay, one of thank you again, Justin. So, and oh, yeah, sorry, I want to just add that, like, I think that you know one of the things that is really in, important, um, you know, a, a lot of the work that BHMF is engaged in is about providing platforms for the voices of of our communities and of the people that have been engaged in this. And so, so much of the reflection on the column is about really giving space to people who have been contributing and writing and thinking in these terms. Um, and I, I think it's also one thing I, I would be uh, remiss to not uh, mention other um, team members who have been so crucial to sort of getting us here. So, I mean, I've already sort of listed, uh, you know, pretty much the BHMF team, but we also have like these ongoing relationships with interns, which I think that we've relied a lot on um, U.S. schools and study abroad programs um, to bring students willing to get engaged in this conversation. And in this moment where there is so much um, uncertainty about the um, state of study abroad, right? Um, I think it's really important to sort of acknowledge um, some of the connections and communities that have been developed through the work. We've had any number of 10 to 12 interns in any given moment. And some of those have become really core team members, including Nara Seymour, who's uh, worked with us for the past two years, Tatiana Leipern, who's worked with us for the past two years, um, and coordinating those um, interns and really sort of working on different forms of strategy, including the outreach and education of youngsters in the context of Italy is also Mark Seduarte, who has been working with us for a number of years now. And I think it's so important to sort of think about the ways in which we can provide things for the future generations and the ways in which these kinds of conversations, these kinds of uh, spaces are actually gathering places for the development of new communities, a lot of which are temporary. And I think it's important, like when we think about um, um, the capacity to sustain something, the sustainability of something, I think it's important to acknowledge the importance of some things that are just fleeting, that are ethereal, that are there. And in that moment, they are this sort of incredible moment. And they may, maybe not everything needs to sort of sustain itself forever, but we do need to appreciate every moment we have as a sort of gathered um, group and collectivity, every exchange, every dialogue we have is super important. Right. No, thank so thank you uh, again for this invitation. No, no, it's been wonderful to hear you speak, Justin, and we're very much looking forward to following up on the work you're doing and sharing that um, via the Florentines platform as well. Um, so thank you again, and to everyone who is tuned in as well. Um, uh, we look forward to hearing more. And for anyone else who would like to join in to another TF together, you can see the rest of the lineup at the link at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so thank you and ciao. Yeah.